So the mission of our team, which is basically an extension of Google's core mission, is to make critical crisis information available to those who are affected when they need it, as quickly as possible and as usefully as possible. And what I'm going to talk today about is, is a little bit of a case study from Sandy. There's a bunch of other ones I would have loved to address, given we've already talked about alerting and various other things, but about the diversity of information sources and how we can integrate them. And it's a very different kind of problem from integrating for a citizen who wants to know how to stay safe or what actions to take, from integrating for first responders or incident commanders trying to figure out what uh, command and control operations they can take. And I think that's a really important difference. So as I said, we're part of uh, Google's philanthropic mission. But one way to think about this is that um, Google has a whole pile of divisions and groups that make products that aren't monetized. It's actually about our metrics are about use, views, etc. And our metrics are about social impact. But as you see in a second, I think, we also get those use and view things because people are really looking to Google to answer questions that they need to know during an emergency. And I've just come back from Australia uh, literally late last night. We were working on the fire response for the bushfires where I just did the sums. Um, a quarter of a million acres were burnt over the past four days in a couple of different towns. And uh, we saw going on well over a million uh, queries a day for the kind of information about bushfires and locations and so forth. So our team does two things. We do responses. I scramble anything we can do for major events to get the information that people want and need. Right? Wherever we can get it from, however we can show it, and we have a bunch of tools that we develop to try and make that easier, to make that scalable at Google scale, and to make that something that hopefully we can automate. Because this scattering, while sort of impressive for a small team to respond to, is actually nothing compared to the range of events the Red Cross has to deal with, I'm a volunteer in New York City, um, or that ordinary people all over the world have to handle. So uh, this is the obligatory Haiti slide. I heard that there were a bunch of Haiti slides, so I figured I'd have to put my own in. Um, so the team, our team at Google really came together during the Haiti response in 2010. And I wasn't, it was actually before I came to Google, I was actually on the ground in Haiti, um, watching and interacting with who are now my colleagues uh, at that time. And one of the things Google does very well, it was already made mention about Google Earth and imagery, we have these channels for consumer imagery very quickly. Trust me, I'd love the LiDAR stuff, right? Or the LiDAR, um, uh, but what we are able to do is source from our partners imagery that shows this kind of stuff happening over time. And frankly, for almost every first responder on the ground, this is what they used, not the kinds of detailed imagery because of the silos that happen between sort of particularly military and civilian operations. So uh, this is one of the things we did. And then we realized, well, what else can we do? Right? We're a tech company. We did this in Hurricane Katrina. Uh, let's try and do some additional things. Well, we can make maps. We can provide tools for first responders and citizens to look for mapping. Okay? Whip something up. Information fragmentation around missing persons was a massive issue in Haiti in the first few days. And again, this is a consumer viewpoint, if you like. Just to say, people had to go to something like somewhere between 15 and 20 different websites to find information about missing persons. And with a huge diaspora, this is a critical issue. Right? Um, because you didn't even know which one you weren't looking at. Right? So we've worked at that time to build an open source solution for aggregating missing persons information. And now it's had hundreds of thousands of people entered all over the world into these systems for, uh, I don't actually even know the number of emergencies we've launched it for. Every time there's an earthquake over M5 in Japan, it's automatically launched and integrated with all of the national carriers for missing persons reporting and their databases are tightly integrated. Right? Um, so yeah, for the Yan earthquake in uh, China earlier this year, uh, it was a big coup for us in the fact that all of the national, all the Chinese social media services and web services integrated with Person Finder because it uses an open architecture with a data standard called PFIF uh, to basically, we had a hole created in the Great Firewall of China to enable Person Finder to communicate and aggregate across all these services. But it's not enough if you don't connect it to what people actually do on the ground. If their own sort of personal experiences, anyone who's been close to a large tragedy has unfortunately seen these same kind of walls of notes 
of people saying, have you seen my loved ones? And one of the things I love about having an open system that actually invites uh, community participation and crowdsourcing is that people come up with creative solutions about how to bridge these divides. We've worked with official agencies in India, in the Philippines, all over the place to actually enable scanning, character recognition, all kinds of things of official sources. But this is what people took into their own hands to do in Japan after the, the sort of earthquake and tsunami, is that they took photos uploaded to a common Picasso picture gal gallery on the web and went through and manually transcribed the names off the photos and then entered them into Person Finder and checked off whether they'd been there. So people set up this ad hoc workflow. And one of the things that is my strongest takeaway from sort of nearly two decades of working on this and certainly a decade of really intensive field work um, internationally is that for most responses, the diversity of participants and the increasing engagement of ordinary citizens taking care of their own lives right, with technology empowerment means that you can't have one fixed system that everybody's going to use. You can't have one fixed approach or workflow for how things are going to be integrated. And you can where you have a clear command and control system, and that's appropriate. But when you go out to public data and people helping each other in circumstances where there's not one operator, you have to have an open, flexible architecture and open standards to make that work. Right? And you have to be prepared for the fact that people can innovate as they go right? and be dynamic and adaptable. So one of the other tools we've built, which is sort of the opposite of uh, adaptable, if you like, is we have the opportunity to build on Google scale infrastructure for where Google are look, people are looking. And this is a complement to the Red Cross's work, is that we take uh, in a large number of places all over the world now um, and increasing official alert information and we show it where people are looking. It is great to have an installed app, but most people don't have that app. Right? Most people don't even know about that app's existence. Right? What people do do is, and I'll show you a picture in a second, is they come to Google to search for information about oh, what's happened. Is there a tornado coming? Are there shelters? And so forth. So one of our challenges is how do we integrate open data and make it immediately available, indexed, and referenceable? And there's a really good question that came out before about, well, aren't you going to show, how do you show people the most severe alerts? Do you buzz the phone all the time? Do they get minor alerts? I could give you and have given an entire talk about the challenges of geotargeting, um, ranking, et cetera. It's a complement to everything Google does with search, but now we have to do it for emergency information. Right? And Google now is interesting. It's a service on most mobile phones, most modern mobile phones now, which actually has the chance to, built in to buzz your phone if we get an emergency alert. And it's interesting because these are complements, not replacements for things the Red Cross is doing or FEMA is doing with push alerting. Because what we consistently see with FEMA's push alerts, the, the wireless uh, broadcast alerts, right, is people get buzzed in the middle of the night with 110 characters of message. And this happens in Australia. They were just sending out SMSs. Um, good luck trying to get throughput um, to millions of people, but still. Um, but the broadcast alerts, people get a 90 character, sorry, it is in the US, a 90 character message. And what is any? Any votes for what the first action someone does if they receive a 90 character message in the middle of the night? They go and search on Google. Okay? Right? What is that? And prior to us getting and ingesting the alert data directly, the answer was no idea as far as Google was concerned. So people were actually becoming more confused and more anxious by broadcast alerting without having a good complementary data source that they could find easily. Um, and I have to say that we keep getting blamed for, for FEMA or local authorities waking people up in the middle of the night with alerts that they don't want. So uh, I'll take that heat if it means we're being useful. Right? We also work on open web mapping, which is another, another one of our strengths. And um, this is a tool, Crisis Maps, we've been building for many years. It builds on that first map that we had. But it's an open web mapping platform that is probably the most flexible one on the internet at the moment in terms of ability to rapidly create a mashup of lots of different data sources and data types. And so actually, it's open source. So I really urge, and we're actually seeing a lot of integrations using the tools that we built and the visualization tools for being able to mash up and overlay everything from Esri uh, services, REST services, WMS services, KML, Google layers, et cetera, et cetera, and to just be able to go bloop, 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 and handle 
traffic like you would not believe. Um, so these are some maps we created for Hurricane Sandy. And it works because we'd actually had access and a good relationship um, where you build on the previous year's experience for Hurricane Irene to be able to, in Sandy, take the evacuation zones and put it on the map. We have the Red Cross shelter data. Uh, my little dig to the Red Cross is the shelter data is a great feed. It just happens to contain an ad for, ad for Donate Now in the middle of it. Um, and it is an awesome piece of work that we're able to get that open data and put it here because it's wherever people are looking. As I said, it's a complement to the app, which provides a much richer experience. But here we have, OK, it's in a different kind of a context. You may well ask, OK, that's fine, but the internet goes down. Five years ago, I would have said, three years ago, I would have said, uh, absolutely, it goes down. Right? You can't rely on it. You need offline solutions, local caching, peer-to-peer -peer data exchange, et cetera. And while that is certainly still the case in many circumstances, the consistent story I now have as a believer in this is that the internet is actually much more resilient than we would have expected and often much more resilient than voice phone networks and SMS phone networks. And it's actually why the internet was built, right? Does packet-based resilient uh, interconnects. So these are a couple of our edge cache traffic servers monitoring uh, traffic in and out of Chile and Japan. And we've got equivalent ones for Haiti and elsewhere. That after the Chile earthquake, which was right south of Santiago, near one of the main interconnects into the country, um, Japan, et cetera, right? we saw dips in traffic. And the dip in Japan, I actually don't think is necessarily due to people not being able to connect. I think it's because they were looking at different things at the time. I could be wrong there. And the bottom graph is actually people looking for flooding. Uh, and this is in Colorado. We're able to, if you go to Google Trends, you can see there's quite amazing graphs about what people are searching for. That spike is people searching for flooding just a couple of months ago. Right? So people are looking. An equivalent here is these are searches from Hawaii uh, for the word, for searches that contain the word tsunami. On the day of the Japan earthquake, that made up fully a quarter of searches from Hawaii. You know, that is a lot of people looking for that information. And I don't have the slide up here, but the answers that we as Google, Bing, and everybody else gave to those searches, which people were looking for, I've got the full semantic analysis about the, sort of the breadth of the queries they're looking for. They want to know, is there an alert? Am I safe? Do I have to evacuate? All the standard things, right? The answers that we had was, Oh, the 2004 tsunami from Indonesia, the Tsunami Museum in Oahu, right? Not anything that's actionable or useful. And in many ways, that's the generation of our, that's what led to our public alerting project to come on board, right? I got the slide slightly out of order, but basically this is a, a piece of evidence we have. And in Christchurch, after the earthquake, we've got many more uh, other examples from all around the world as well. But basically the fact that uh, the email systems wouldn't go through, SMS wouldn't go through, but uh, some of the web-based systems actually would. There's a whole richness here to figure out about resilience of communication networks from a consumer point of view that I haven't gone through fully. We've just got a smattering of evidence. Right? The other story that was mentioned before was that mobile. I mean, the mantra for software development is mobile first, that's fine. But it's really interesting to look at the evidence about the proportion of mobile users we're getting, people making queries or looking at our services. And even as recently as a year and a half ago in the US, we were getting sort of 15%, 20% max, and that was a good day. Consistently for events in Australia, the India cyclone failing just two, two weeks ago, uh, the Colorado floods, the North India flooding, we're getting well over 40 to 70% mobile usage of people looking at our maps, looking at our information, looking at our services. Right? So any agency that is not building mobile first or not making their sites mobile optimized or their web presences, or particularly their maps mobile optimized, is not serving their users. So we actually saw the rural fire service in New South Wales and Australia send people to our map, which we developed in conjunction with them, rather than their own services and maps, partly because their site was collapsing under the load, but partly because their maps and services were not usable on mobile. And uh, we don't like to release hard numbers, but let me just say that that peak there, um, this is Hurricane Sandy views on our crisis map that I showed before. 
was the highest map traffic day Google has ever had at that point in time. So uh, I have to say that this had a whole pile of people at Google running around trying to make sure the server stayed up. Okay, so these are big days that you, my message to public agencies is actually, I would so much rather that you used a cloud, our cloud, someone else's cloud, I don't really care, but a good cloud, right, to keep and share your data than spend hard earned dollars that should be spent on responses keeping web servers running, which is not core business. Right? Um, I call this anecdata. We've got a bunch of lovely stories about people saying how you helped me evacuate from my house and save my family's life, et cetera, which complements the Red Cross's feedback as well. Right? Um, this makes executives feel good, but at Google, they also want the hard numbers um, that we try and figure out. And it's really hard when you're talking about metrics to say how does the information lead to outcomes that save lives. Everybody struggles with this. I struggle with this making asks from OFDA for dollars for funding for humanitarian projects in the past as well. Right. I'm going to go through this last bit fairly quickly, but we've actually done, uh, we know the basics about accurate, relevant, credible, timely, accessible information. There's a bunch of research on this. We've actually been funding our own user research and ethnographic research as well as survey work in a few parts of the world uh, and trying to expand that and we're going to be publishing that for open use. Um, so, so quite extensive survey work, as I said, um, because a bunch of geeks sitting in an office really can't imagine what this is like, right? And what the needs are of these people. And so the design principles for this are really quite different. So this is just a smattering. This will be in the slides that will get shared. And as I said, hopefully we'll be publishing this fairly soon. This is based on some ethnographic work we did in New Orleans just recently. Um, and we've got a whole pile more from Indonesia and some other locations, as I mentioned. Um, these are the kind of things, these are the highlights of what people are looking for. Uh, and we've got sort of user profiles and basically breaking down different information needs for different segments of the population. Right? So what I really realized when we came to, came to Google, when I came to Google, but also just particularly this year, is that we had a lot of anecdotes about what we thought people wanted. We had data about what people were pro valuing that we put online. But we didn't have the Rumsfeld quote about the, sort of the unknown unknowns, if you like, right? So part of the onus on us was to actually go and figure out what people were really needing. Because we had the search information, but not actually what was even missing from that. Right? So during, um, this complements some of the information the Red Cross had about what they're looking for at different phases. Right? Uh, they're looking for this range of behaviors, but it does segment depending on who people are in the population and the roles they play. Some people are about looking after themselves. Some people are just information sharers. And these archetypes are really important to understand. And some people are providing assistance to their community. That's how they find value. And afterwards, there's a lot of service-based information afterwards, which is pretty clear. I think the big difference, as was pointed out uh, by the Red Cross, was that so before and during, people are trying to figure out, OK, what do I have to do? Shelters, evacuations, and so forth. Depends on how much early warning there is. Right. And the during is, OK, what's happening? It's the situational awareness more than anything else. The after is the services. What could I access? Also, where is everyone? Like, where are my loved ones? Where are my pets? Where are my things like this? Right. And then long after is the, the slow drumbeat of recovery. But clearly, recovery actually starts the moment after someone determines that they're safe. That's when recovery begins. These are the obvious things, basically. It summarizes what's happening, where are the people I care about, and where are the resources I need. So the final piece, and I'll hopefully be done fairly quickly, is a data provider's point of view looks at these people as the sources of the information. Right? And trusted official information is something that we integrate in our alerts. It's really critical for us. Right? But these are the other sources of information. When I'm going out there and we're trying to put together a map of Cyclone Phelan about emergency evacuation shelters and numbers, none of the Indian authorities had anything at all that was public and accessible. It all came through press conferences that was re-reported through the traditional media. It was never aggregated in one place. It was never persistent. And then there's the user's point of view. So this creates a very complex operating environment for a responder. It's an even more complex one for an individual trying to figure out what to do. There's good science about how people make decisions. 
Um, Dennis Miletti and Jeanette Sutton have a couple of great papers about how people make decisions on acting during for warnings and emergencies that I encourage people to go to. Sandy was interesting, it plays out in this way. I want to use gas as a quick case study about the complexity and the needs for considering all the aspects of the data. Everybody knows in Sandy gas shortages were a particular problem. It's actually not something we'd seen in one of our responses before. Replace gas with road closures for the Boulder floods, replace road closures with uh, road closures actually in Australia for the wildfires just now. There's a, a continually changing set of focal points for different emergencies. There's some constancy. Um, we received from the Office of Homeland Security in the state of New Jersey a map of availability of gas in New Jersey. It's not a map, sorry, it was a spreadsheet. Mapping it was another thing. We're pretty good at that, so we're able to get that done fairly quickly. Right? Um, and this came from Exxon. It came from their official contacts with uh, the gas station franchise owners. That's awesome. OK, let's put on the map right now useful for people. About two hours later, we were able to get from another official agency in New Jersey a completely different set of gas stations were open or closed. Right? Okay, that's cool, let's put it on the map as well, right? Okay. Um, and we got a whole pile of stuff from uh, FEMA as well, right? from some analysis from different places, right? And the All Hazards Consortium was a great provider for both of these things, right? So we're trying to backtrack to say, where the heck did this data come from? Is it the same? Do they have timestamps? Do we know which one's more up to date than the other one? Is some of this static or is it active? What the hell's going on here? Which is the freshest? Because if I'm trying to show to our users information that lets them make decisions, right? okay, I want to know should I go out and drive to this gas station or that gas station? What am I going to do? Turns out the best data was actually on Twitter, NJ Gas on Twitter, right? Because people were reporting what was open or closed. Right? But we took that and said we put this stuff on the map, and instantly it was the feedback we get, we've got a lot of real time feedback on our, our maps and our products, was that it was out of date. So we aggregated the data, we were able to show it was available or not. And what we did was we switched, basically, it's great working for Google, we've got some good coders who can just make things happen on the fly. So we included the ability for people to comment directly on every point, every gas station we had data on, to say, is it open or closed and when was it there? Now, there, these things are risky. You have an open crowdsourcing solution without a lot of filters that you build on the fly that's not a great way to be doing business, particularly if you're a big company. But we do it anyway, and let's see what happens. Right? So we got real-time graphs of gas station open or closed. Another thing then popped up, right? which is that a great bunch of students uh, worked with a group called Mapler. Right? Um, and these are high school students right? who went out and actually scraped the web for the open closed data from Twitter and so forth, right? and tried to map it together to keep it up to date as real time as possible. There's a bunch of high school kids sitting in their computer lab at school going tick, 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 tick. These people did not exist on any official radar for who was going to be assisting with a response, but they were responsible for the most accurate and up-to-date gas availability information for every citizen in New Jersey, right? The old paradigm of official responses and responders having the authority of data is broken now. It's wrong, right? And these things have to be adaptable and ad hoc. So we were able to end up with, very quickly, uh, towards, unfortunately, all these things take time. But within a couple of days of the gas crisis in New Jersey and New York City taking off, to get basically the best authority of crowdsourced and official corrected data set of what gas was available and what wasn't. Right? Um, and that's something that we're still figuring out how we make that available for every disaster, for every data layer that we work on and build into our open source tools so people can use that and reuse that and that we can integrate with systems like Ushahidi and other tools that people are using for crowdsourcing already. Right? It's not an easy project to think about how that stuff works. Um, but the basis of it is the following, which is no trouble for IEEE or anyone who works with standards, is basically simple standard and open. Right? Uh, it is actually the only reason we can do this is these three things exist. Right? And a lot of my team's work and my work during a disaster is to call up official agencies and say, you say these three words in your press releases, now it's time to live up to it. Right? 
and let's see where we can get to. So that's a little bit on the, the life of the emergency. I guess the one thing I forgot to say that we had the advantage of with, with the, the gas is we actually pushed a, a card on Google Now, a buzz on your phone, um, to people in New Jersey if they were near one of the gas stations, was to say, hey, there are gas stations in your area. Would you like to comment on whether it's open or closed? So you can close the feedback loop. Right? Now, that was extraordinarily ad hoc. Right? Don't like doing that, et cetera. So how do we make that more consistent? I'll leave it at there. Thank you.